Good morning, good morning, good morning, church. If everybody could stand up and get ready to worship, we're going to lift our voices to the Lord and bring him praise. I wanted to read out of Psalm 66. By the way, if someone's like, hey, I think that's my Bible. I, this is in the lost and found. So. <clears throat> all right, Psalm 66. Shout for joy to the Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. So let's lift our voices and sing praise to his name this morning. Whether you're a mountaintop person or you like to be at the beach and enjoy the ocean, um, we have evidence everywhere we look of our great God, his creation, his faithfulness. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's praise him together. Reaches of
search the world, it couldn't fill me. And empty praise and treasures the faith.
stars align. You take death and you give it life. You defeated death and you put life where it belongs. God, give us this revelation. Give us the revelation that death is defeated and we live in eternal life with you. We are no longer subject to death. We are no longer subject to the power of sin. We are no longer subject to the powers and principalities of this world. They have been vanquished in the name of Jesus. We live in eternity with you. Here and now, we live in eternity with you. We exist in your realm. We live our life in your realm in the name of Jesus. God, give us this revelation. Let us understand what this means. Let us understand that the power of what the power that you have given us. Let us understand the, the gifting that we have in you, God. If we grasped this, there would be absolutely no telling what the Lord would do through us. Limitations would leave. Fear would leave. Concern for man would leave. Imagine walking in the fullness of the power of God. Imagine walking in all that he's given us and all that he wants us to be. had this scripture on my heart all week and I believe it's for the assembly. When Israel crossed over the Jordan River and entered the promised land, God told them these words. He said, he said about the ark, yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you should go for you have not passed this way before. And the Lord quickened to me that phrase, you have not passed this way before and we are in need of keeping our eyes glued on Jesus in this hour because we've not we're going to see things happening in the earth that's already happening that most of us have never seen but we need to keep our eyes glued on Jesus Christ and not be afraid of the things that are coming father we thank you this morning that you are the God who is sovereign over all you have plans and you, you have a purpose in this hour for the things that we are enduring. We pray that we might be a people whose eyes are glued on Jesus because we have not gone this way before, but you've gone this way because you, you purposed it, Lord, and we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
just going to take a few minutes and meditate on Jesus being the cornerstone. That no matter what trials and things that we go through, that he is a rock. And there will come a day when everything is made right and it's worth it. He is faithful. He is good. Let's just think about that. Praise him right now. What we have looking forward to us someday is to gather our brothers and sisters from all around the world and worship the one who is worthy together. Mm.
Father, you are worthy of everything. We're only here today because you allowed us to have breath. We're only here today as one body, in one mind, and one accord because of your blood that you shed. We're only here today under the grace of God by you and what you have done, Lord. Everything that we are or could be, God, is only available because of you, Lord Jesus. It's it. So God, right now, can we just give you everything, Lord God, that every morning we wake up, day and night, night and day, let incense rise, Lord. So would the praise of our lives come out every day, every morning, every night. God, let it be. Let it be, Lord Jesus, that as we go from place to place, Lord, that it would be you that would be seen. Lord God, that just in our actions, Lord God, let them speak of your greatness because you are so good. So God, let our church be every time that these doors are open, every day that these doors are open, Lord God, that incense would rise to you, Lord God. Every day of our lives at home, Lord God, as as the things that we see, the things that we listen to, the things that we watch. God, the things that we say, Lord, let all of it bring glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Let it all bring honor to your name, Lord Jesus. Day and night, night and day, Lord, let the incense of our life raise up and praise to you, Father, because you are worthy of it all. All of it, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that we can be here, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you use us. You could have done all of this without us, Lord, but you chose to use us. We thank you that we get to be a part of your plan. And I pray, Lord God, that we can be a part of your plan. And God, right now, Lord Jesus, with so many things going on in the world, Lord, we pray for peace, God. God, the things with Israel, and God, we God, even still with Ukraine, God, in so many other places in the world right now, God, with Burma, God, I could, I, we could go on all day talking about all of the unrest that's in this world, God. But we pray right now for peace. We pray for families, Lord Jesus. We pray for our brothers and our sisters throughout this world, Lord, right now. We pray that you would just give them strength, Lord God. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, they will fear no evil, for you are with them. Your rod and staff comfort them, God. And I just pray right now for each and every one of them, Lord. Be with them, Father. Be with them, Lord. And bring others to the saving knowledge of your grace and your mercy so that they can have hope, Lord. God, that they would find hope as there's war going on and bombs and guns and all of these things. God, that they would find their hope in you alone. You alone, Lord Jesus. Because that's the only place where peace is found. True, true peace. The only way it's found is in your name, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Man, our Lord is so good every single day, isn't he? Man, well, I'm Derek. I'm one of your pastors. It is so good to be with each and every one of you today. If this is your first or second time here at Trinity. We just want to say welcome. So glad that you came out to be with us today. There is a connection card right in front of you or a QR code behind me. And I'd like for you to just scan that. You can actually scan the QR code on the paper too and just fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable. Why do we do this? We want to pray with you. So if we know your name and and if you had prayer requests, we pray every Tuesday as a staff and as an elder for these. And we want to pray with you that you will find the place that God has for you to be. Because each and every one of us as body of Christ are part of the body, some way, say, some shape, some form. And if you're not in the body that God has for you to be in, then it's missing. And whether that be here or another great church in Knoxville somewhere, we want you to be a part. 
And so if you would just take a moment and fill that out so that we can pray with you that you'll find that. And we hope that it's here, but if it's not, we want to pray that, you, that they find you because they need you, right? We have a, our opportunities to give this morning. As always, you know that we've been doing our uh, hands and feet offering, which is above and beyond our tithes. And we thank God for the opportunity to give. But we give, each and every one of us are going to give somehow this morning. You're going to give out of the abundance of what you've been given. Might be at a sacrifice, but God blesses each and every bit of it. And you have a number of ways you can do that. Giving on the screen there with texting or in the back. And so just do that however. And as far as your uh, hands and feet offering as well, you can still just drop that into an envelope or there are drop downs underneath all of the things as ways that you can give this morning. This Thursday night is the third Thursday. What happens on the third Thursday? It's behind me. It's behind me. It's right there. It's right. The gathering place. What happens every Wednesday? Does anybody know? You. There you go. All right. <laughs> Y'all heard that. <laughs> no, we got a great group of young adults, and we have a great group of young adults, right? <laughs> Teens and young adults. So this Thursday night is our monthly meeting with the gathering place, and so come on out if you are 20 to 30 something. I am not anymore, unfortunately, but April the 18th, so at six o'clock, come in for a meal. Uh, they have a great time together, so please come out to that. Next Sunday, if you are uh, a single or a widow elderly, um, you are more than welcome to come out to our uh, lunch after meeting next Sunday. It's a great time of fellowship together and growing together, just being there with one another. So please take advantage of that right after church next Sunday. And then also next Sunday evening at 6 p.m., Neil, where's he at? Neil, he's right there. He was up a little bit earlier. He's going to be doing our Seder, all right? And so Neil will demonstrate um, a full a full thing of the Passover Seder. And I'm just going to read this really quick. The, the Seder was the special meeting that God told the Israelites to eat annually after the death of the sacrificial lamb. The blood of the lamb was applied to the doorpost. We all know that story, right? And uh, the blood of the lamb was applied to the doorpost of every house in Israel, saving them from the wrath. Over the centuries, the Seder grew in tradition, especially in the addition of four cups of wine taken throughout the meal. So Neil reenacts all the events that occurred in the upper room that night where our Lord Jesus had the Last Supper. So it's a really cool way to understand fully what it is. And so he's going to do that full um, Seder meal here at 6 p.m. next Sunday if you want to be a part of that, okay? And then um, uh, we're going to have our spring serve day. A lot of us were a part of the serve day last year, and we're going to have two of them this year. So uh, the smaller of the serve days is coming up on April the 27th from 9 to 12. Please scan that QR code and let us know you're coming so that we can make sure that we have all of the things, you know, because if I only have five or six people that are going to be working at one side, I might only have that many uh, tools and things for you, but if I need to know if you're coming so that I can be prepared for you. So please let us know if you're coming to that or if you might come to that. I'd rather have too much than not enough. So please let us know you're coming to that. And then the last thing here is, um, well, actually, it's not the last thing. There's one more after it. Uh, but the deeper steel. How many people know what deeper steel is? Okay, great. There's so many people that get to know that. All right, so Deeper Steel is a ministry that is not of us, but it is an affiliation. We love them. We love what they're doing, and they help abortion-wounded people. All right, and some people go to this numerous times because it is so good. Um, so if you want to know more information about that, you can scan this QR code right there or go to tccnox.com to find their website on ways that you can help uh, others um, find uh, help uh, that have had an abortion, or if you yourself have been touched by an abortion of some sort uh, and you need to find healing in that. This is an awesome ministry to be a part of and find out how you can get help with that. And then the last thing is our 50th anniversary celebration. Can you believe it? 50 years, a number of these people right here were in a living room making a church, and we are standing on the shoulders of giants right now because of what they've done. 50 years, and so we want you to mark your calendar for June the 1st and the 2nd. It's going to be an amazing weekend. 
please be available for the whole weekend. It's going to be very good as we look back at the shoulders of giants that we have been standing on. And then as we step into what God is doing right now, and then we praise God for what he's going to do in the future. All right, so be available for that. Thank you guys so much. All right, so the last thing is we have a, spe- a very special guest. You know, we talked about this morning, just for briefly, about our hands and feet offering, which Mark talked about last week and we've been preparing you for, right? These are different ways that you can uh, use your monies to just reach the world. And each one of us, though, do this on a normal basis as well through the church in our ministries, right? And so we have a missionary here with us this morning. He is our missionary from Poland, Bartek, and his wife, Daria, who's not here today. But we do support Bartek on a regular basis and his wife. And uh, so he's going to tell us about what's been going on, how you could be a part. He's going to be out front. And there's plenty of ways that you can meet with him this week. So please take an uh, opportunity to go see him if you want to have him over for dinner if you want to have him for lunch, so that you can get to know a little bit more about what he's doing and what God's doing in Poland. Thank you. I'm, I'm super excited to be here with you today, and I waited two years to say hello, Trinity Community Church. Last time we were here was two years ago. I was uh, here with my wife and son, and they are uh, saying hi from Poland to you. And um, yeah, just uh, a little bit about me. I'm, my name is Bartek, my wife is Daria, and our son is Jonah. We are missionaries from Poland to the country of Poland. And um, uh, I'm excited to share a little bit about what God is doing uh, in Poland. But first, I want to just say thank you, thank you so much. So much thanks uh, we, we give to Trinity Community Church for partnering with us, for praying for us. We know that the church is partnering with us, but a lot of you are also partnering with us. So we are so grateful and so thankful for you to be there with us in a significant way in Poland. And what we do, we can only do because people like you uh, that are partnering with us. So thank you. Um, So uh, a little bit about uh, our family. Uh, I already told you, but I brought some pictures because they are they cannot be here with me, so this is the next best thing. Uh, but uh, to, for you to understand what we're doing in Poland, you need to understand a little bit about our history. So, Poland <coughs> is a country in Central Europe uh, between Germany and Russia. And you, if you know anything about history, you know that it's never been a good place to be. Uh, there has been a lot of war, a lot of conflict, and it's still there. Uh, like uh, Ukraine is next door neighbor to Poland, bordering us in the east. And you know, you, you've been seeing in the news what's happening there. So Poland has experienced this uh, type of conflict and other types of conflict for hundreds of years. And actually, for 100 years, there was no Poland. There was no, no, no country named Poland because our land has been divided between our neighboring countries. Uh, and then we, then we reappeared in the maps after World War I, only to be put under Nazi and uh, Russian rule and occupation a few decades later. And it's been only since the 80s that we have been able to regain our independence. So we are still there, we're still, still kicking, but hopefully that will not change, uh, but you never know. Uh, and um, one thing that you need to know too is that Poland has been a Catholic nation for over a thousand years. And we believe that that's been a big part of how Poland has been able to stay Polish. Uh, the, culture, the culture was what people clinged to when there was no country of Poland. And so Catholicism is a big part of being Polish, uh, we've been a Catholic nation for over 1,000 years. Uh, 1,000 years ago, the king, we used to have a king, the king of Poland got baptized into the Catholic faith, and together with him, symbolically, the whole nation became Catholic. But it wasn't the decision of every single citizen on their own and their decision about coming from their faith. It was just a political decision by the king, and it affected the whole country. So it gives, it gives a pretty good picture of the current religious climate <clears throat> in our country, where still 
parents will, when they, when they uh, have a baby, they will baptize the baby into the Catholic Church, but the person never really makes a conscious and personal decision to follow Christ. And actually, the concept of having a personal relationship with, relationship with, with Christ is not even present in our country. So people are very aware that there is this gospel of works that you're supposed to work and work and work for your salvation and try and perform rituals and just hope and hope. And you never know for sure. You never know for sure whether God will or will not allow you to into his kingdom. That's, the, that's how the Catholics believe. So because of that and because of... Uh, People being used to seeing, uh, hearing things about God on Sunday, but then they are not lived out throughout the week. Uh, many people are just Catholic in name, so they will say they're Catholic, but they will say they do not believe in God. Uh, they will think of themselves of Christians, but they will not believe in Christ. And many of them will just say that they do not believe anymore, but still they cling to their Catholic identity. So the sad reality is that only 0.3% of people in Poland are believers, so people who've been born again in Christ. So that's the current situation in Poland, and the question is, how do you reach a country that is so distant from God? It's so used to hearing about Christ in church, but so distant from uh, actually being changed by, 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 by Him and by His Word. Uh, well, we believe that there is two ways to do it. One way is that on the national level, we need to change how people view Christianity in Poland. Uh, I've been raised Catholic, and my mom, when she heard I've, I've, uh, that I've been uh, going to an evangelical church, she prayed and cried and prayed to God to save me from the cult I've been joining. Because that's how people think about uh, Christianity other than the Catholic Church in, in our country. So, uh, change on the national level. We believe that there, that's necessary. And in 2018, we've uh, begun a movement called Evangelical Poland. And it's basically a place, a network, a uh, platform for where Christians can come together and instead of fighting with one another, instead of debating all of their differences, they actually can cling to what brings them together and try to share that more effectively with the lost people of our country. <clears throat> so it started in 2018, and we shared the vision with uh, some key leaders and pastors in Poland to, to say that this is what we want to do. We want to bring Christians together because that's what Christ told us, that they will know you but they're, by, their, by your love for each other. And that love has been lacking in Poland. So we, we shared that vision with them. And they said that it's a beautiful vision, but it probably will not work in Poland. Because even though we're so small, we're so used to fighting with one another. But we kept at it. We kept inviting people. And people started coming, people who believed the same vision, who shared the heart of unity. And here we are in 2024. This is where we are right now. Evangelical Poland has become the largest uh, interdenominational collaboration movement in the whole country of Poland. It uh, already uh, around 30% of all Christian churches in Poland are part of the movement and 60% of all Polish pastors are part of the movement. Over 150 organizations, Christian organizations has, have joined us and uh, I'm telling you this not because I, I boast in this, because I know very well that this is not something that is uh, from, coming from a human. Uh, nobody could have done this, especially in five years, but God has done this, and this is the reality that we have now in Poland. So part of how I serve with Evangelical Poland is that I am responsible for graphic design and video editing and putting out videos about what we do, encouraging people. So I actually put together a video uh, celebrating the five years of Evangelical Poland. We celebrated five years of the movement. So please enjoy and see how God is work at work in Poland. <laughs>
so 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 that's what God is doing currently in Poland. Uh, and uh, before I go into the local side of our ministry, I just want to share one more thing because I know that uh, part of your church was getting ready for a trip to Poland to come and help renovate a building because one of the projects we're trying to accomplish is to have the first ever. Uh, Evangelical Poland and Christian Training Center for Christians and a retreat center in the northwestern part of Poland. Unfortunately, that trip had to be moved because as we were ready to purchase the building with funds that God miraculously provided, the owner suddenly changed his uh, the rules of the agreement and uh, made it basically uh, that it would be irresponsible of us to to put so many much money into a project that could there was a risk that we would lose all that money that God provided so the vision is still there we are not pulling away from the project we're currently actually now looking for a uh, alternative building that we could uh, buy and and um, make sure that it fits our needs so if that happens if and when that happens we invite you to come over and help uh, help with uh, with the renovation of that building but I want to share a little bit about the other side of our ministry, which is maybe less flashy but also exciting, which is the local church that we have planted in 2018 in the city of Poznań, Poland, where we live. God has put it on our hearts to plant a church that will focus on community, on relationships, and on family. <clears throat> because we believe that people in Poland, this is what works in Poland. People are so used to hearing about God on Sunday and not seeing Him uh, being lived out in people's lives. So this is what we want to do. We want to show people that Christ can be in your life today. So we started as a house church of six people in 2018. And slowly but surely, God brought more, more and more people. And this is where we are in 2024. <laughs> Once again, nothing from, from man, but all from God. And uh, uh, so we are now a church of 70 plus people, a lot of families with young kids, a lot of youth, 17 plus uh, youth uh, in the gr youth group, which already is more than the average uh, church in Poland has when it comes to, to membership. And this is only because God is in it. And so there, is, there are many stories that we could share, share with you about what God is doing in Poznań. And if you'd like to hear more about the ministry we do uh, in Poland, please uh, contact me. I will be uh, in the lobby after the service, and um, you can, you can, or you can message me or uh, contact me through one of the elders uh, here at Trinity. And I will be in, in Knoxville until the 24th, and I would love to meet with you and share more about what God is doing in Poland because it's exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Bartek. And we are so excited what God's doing over there. And it's great, great to be partners with you guys and continuing that uh, God will continue working in those things in some amazing ways. So it's great to see you this morning. Welcome to Trinity. And I uh, just want to add something. You know, Neil shared the uh, little prophet, the prophetic word about uh, we're in a place where we're going to a place we've never been before, a land we've never been before. One of the things that uh, the Lord we felt like uh, put on the hearts of the elders is to come on Sunday afternoons, set aside a time from 1.30 to 3 uh, each Sunday to pray for personal and spiritual revival uh, and, and uh, national revival. So I want to invite you, anyone that would like to come, we will be meeting here in the auditorium at 1.30 and we'll go to 3 o'clock if you'd like to come and join us. So hope you can do that. So and we're, we're uh, back in our scriptures this morning and uh, if you want to open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, we're at the very beginning of a new series in 1 Peter we're calling Grace Under Fire, Grace Under Fire. And last week, as you know, if you were here, Mark introduced so well the man who penned this letter, the Apostle Peter, and the lessons that we can learn, that he learned from his time walking with Jesus that were so transformative for uh, Peter's own life. And so we've looked at the man, and now I want us to see, we're going to look at his message, what he has to say to us in this letter. Peter's purpose, from the end of the letter, he tells us in 1 Peter 5, 12, he says, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. 
stand firm in it. Peter knows that too well because there was a time in his life where he had once himself fallen and denied the Lord three times. You talk about a failure, but, <laughs> but as someone once wisely said, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. And uh, so Peter had learned from his mistakes, and he has uh, got, I guess, at a place where he is a lot more mature and a lot more wise. Uh, he has uh, turned the corner, and he's changed in so many ways. So uh, Peter, uh, Jesus stuck to Peter, and Peter stuck to Jesus. And when that happens, things can transform. Peter, for example, describes himself as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. And so now in this letter, a lot wiser Peter lays out for us and these readers the path for these uh, people who are going to experience some growing pressure in some places they never thought they would be, suffering for things they never thought they would have to go through. And so this becomes a real practical thing for us, a letter for us. And I have to ask the question, what is the significance then of Jesus, he modeled his uh, letter off to Jesus' own suffering. What is that significance of Jesus' suffering? How should we, as Christ followers, live out our faith in light of the reality of this resurrection? Because Jesus is alive, right? So, uh, so get ready for a truth bomb. Let me just tell you, let me give you some other ways that people have, uh, have kind of felt the impact of this letter, and maybe Hopefully you will too. Some have accurately described 1 Peter as the most condensed New Testament resume of the Christian faith and of the conduct it inspires. Martin Luther described it as one of the noblest books in the New Testament and a paradigm, paragon of excellence on par with Romans and the Gospel of John. Luther believed it contained all that we need to know, all that's necessary for a Christian to know to live this life. And so today we're going to see that it all starts with a solid foundation. And uh, what we're going to see this morning in, in chapter 1, 1 through 12 is you have to get this in order to live life well. So let's open the, the, the first chapter and hear how to live well in a culture of chaos. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Let's stop right there just a minute because these first two verses that open the letter, they tell us obviously where, uh, who wrote it and who, to whom it was written. And we know the, the writer was obviously Peter, right? And uh, he's an apostle, he says, though, of Jesus Christ. And as one of the original 12 whom Ju Jesus had chosen, Peter is basically telling to his readers, you know, you need to listen up because uh, this is an authoritative word. It comes from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a merely human word. These are the words of God. And so we need to take it that way. Jesus had a unique position to basically... Uh, hear from a master teacher, and his name was Jesus, and so we do too because of what he shared. So the, the writer and then the readers, Peter's writing to believers in a foreign land, and uh, he calls them, if you'll pay, pay attention to those two words, elect exiles. These are elect exiles of the dispersion. So you just see those two words kind of back to back, and they don't really make sense because in one sense, uh, elect means that They've been chosen. Exiles means they've been um, kind of put out of the, the normal comfort zone. And uh, sometimes we ask that question, if I'm a Christian, why am I experiencing these bad things? And we're going to find that a little bit. What a conflict of identity that sometimes that is for us and as it was for these readers uh, in a couple of ways. Number one is that in, in, in relation to the wor world, there's this horizontal dimension, and he calls them there, they, they, he calls them exiles, exiles. That's an interesting term, and it really referred to someone who didn't hold citizenship in a foreign land. So you can imagine the people who, uh, who experienced these people who were foreigners in their own land in that dominant culture, uh, they were uh, described as, uh, in your version, it might say diaspora, the exiles of the diaspora, or exiles of the dispersion. You say, what is that about? Uh, that word contains this idea of being scattered. And uh, 
So Peter takes this metaphor and say that, that you're obviously you're scattered from places that you wouldn't say are really comfortable for you. And this is literally what happened to them. Because of their faith, because of their belief in Jesus, they were scattered and they did so to avoid political, social, physical persecution that they were experiencing in that day. So their, their exiles not only literally, but also t- figuratively. Think about this. Christians, when they did that, they were often viewed, as they are in our day, with suspicion, almost like subversives of the culture. It's like, what are, you, what are these Christians talking about? They're subversives, and they were, uh, they were against the social structures, though often seen in the day. So Karen Jobes writes this. She says, because of their Christian faith, they were being marginalized by their society, alienated in their relationships, and threatened with, if not experiencing, a loss of honor and socioeconomic standing, and possibly worse. The Christians to whom Peter wrote were suffering because they were living by different priorities, values, and allegiances than their pagan neighbors. Sound familiar? If a church and a Christian lives that way in our society, we experience the same things, and we are. You hear stories all around about that. But his words speak directly to their situation, and it speaks to ours. So uh, someone said, as Christians, we live in strange times, or the times we live in make stranger folks out of us. And uh, that's the way the culture sometimes looks at the Christian. Boy, what strange people. Odd. So exiles or strangers in relation to the world, but at the same time, elect. They're elect in relation to God, and this is the vertical relationship. So they're citizens, literally, of heaven at the same time because they're God's chosen people. Peter says in verse, uh, four, chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Now, this is normal when you live like a Christian. So what was happening to these Christians that may have made, it may not have made sense to them? Just like we wonder, like, what in the world is going on? All the stuff, this pushback between, this warfare between good and evil. What in the world is going on? But Peter tells them that their trials have maybe a deeper meaning than they might not have thought of at first. And he says, uh, basically, trials are actually a way of God's glorious dealings with his people. Do you get that? Trials are actually signs of God's gracious dealings with us who are Christians. And someone said one time, and I always remember this, if I know the why, I can deal with any what. If I know the why, I can deal with any what. And really that's what Peter is getting ready to do. So whether you're going, if you're going through all kinds of trials, sickness, disease, broken relationships, loss, betrayal, your dream has died. All these are trials that we all times, at all times, we experience different times in our lives. If I can get through, if I know the why, I can get through any what. And I always just think about this as as I was preparing the message. If you thought of your life as just this singular line from beginning to end, and all the things that you would say, these were negative, these were bad, I wish they hadn't happened to me, and you had, they were just kind of represented by dots alongside of that line. How many of those would you put along the line and say, this is what God actually purposed in my life? That would be hard to do. But this is the perspective that Peter is trying to bring us to. And he tells them why. Sometimes you say, well, why do people suffer? Well, it's right here. He says their circumstances are according to the foreknowledge of God. In other words, the Father has allowed it to happen. It's in his purpose and plan, in his larger purpose and plan. And then he says their suffering is in the sanctification of the Spirit. In other words, by these trials, the Holy Spirit is actually forming them into the image of Christ. They may not see it, but that's what's happening. And then their pressures are for, he says, obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. In other words, they're learning to obey in a place that is hard. A lot of times we want to give up and quit or we act out because we hate the place we're living in. And he said, we learn to obey by those things. And sprinkling with his blood just speaks of the fact that we have assurance that if all these things are happening to us, 
that we're in covenant with Christ. Listen to this verse. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So Peter's trying to get us to understand this is the path that Jesus walked, and this is the path that a Christian will walk. But every place that Jesus walked and every place that we will walk, he will be with us all the way. Acts 14, 22 says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Say, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and sometimes I don't either. But if you're in a place of trouble or trial or hurting, hardship, suffering today, let me just say, don't waste your suffering. Don't waste your suffering. God the Father knew you'd face it. The Spirit of Christ is forming you in it, and the Son will confirm His covenant love with you along the way. This is His purpose and His plan. So let's go on in this letter and see what He has to say. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, with an outburst of praise, right before he tells us everything he's going to tell us, is basically saying, let's worship God for our great salvation. Do you really know what you have here? And so he is praising God before he tells us what he's going to tell us. Let's see what he says. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. So let's ask God this morning to show us the truths of this passage, and let's pray. Father, we're just so grateful for your word this morning. Lord, we're here ready to receive, and Holy Spirit, I pray right now, by your power, you'd open our eyes to these spiritual realities. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and your gracious and kind ways toward us, and we just give these things to you you in Jesus name. So here's the question. What is a, what is a Christian response look like in a culture like ours in times like these? Uh, how do you keep the faith in a hard place? Because I feel, think we all see things kind of headed that direction and maybe experiences some of it even now. You have to, here's the thing, you have to know what you believe before you can know how to live. You have to know what you believe before you can know how to live. So one of, the, one of the books I read first time as I was a new Christian was someone put it in my hand. It was a little book called Know Why You Believe by Paul Little. I still have that book. And it made such a great impact on me. He has another book that follows up with it called Know How or uh, What You Believe. Know Why and Know, know uh, What You Believe. And those, those books transformed my life. And they were basically what they were called apologetics. They were defenses of this faith that we call Christianity, toward those who are outsiders so we would know what to tell them. But I would kind of say, to this, say this, it was great to know that, but in our day, we need an apologetic, a defense for ourselves in this culture that we're living. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. 
So right here at the beginning, the apostle Paul is giving, or apostle Peter is giving the Christian what I would just say is this: just uh, picture him flying at a thirty thousand foot level, looking down. He says, "I I understand this. I want to tell you what I've learned from Jesus," and he's telling this as he shares this bird's eye view of who they are, that is their identity, and what they have to believe in order to know how they have to live in the days ahead. So let's look at it. Verses 3 through 12 tell us what we must believe. And so I would just say, think of this as, uh, as the foundation. This is a theological statement that we're going to get before we see the rest of the story, how to live it out. So what you must believe. That's what we're talking about. And there are three basic areas he goes through here. Listen to these. The realities of the new birth, number one. The certainties of real faith, number two. And then the, the privileges of amazing grace. Now, this is a really interesting sentence in the Greek because in verses 3 through 12, it's a single sentence. One long sentence in the Greek. And it's almost like Peter falls all over himself to try to get out the words of what he's learned. It's dense. It's highly compacted. And so we're going to try to unravel it this morning. And uh, let's look at the first one. He writes, first of all, the realities of new birth. And he says there, according to his great mercy, he has caused us. Who is the he? God the Father. He has caused us to be born again. We heard that term born again, but it, it's the most basic truth. Because Jesus is alive, we can be alive, spiritually alive. And some of you have, have come to that point where you have made a profession of faith, you've received Christ, and you, by virtue of that, have been born again. That new life of Christ has come into you. If you're not, if you don't have that experience, we'd love to, to share that with you, maybe after the time today. Come, come down, and uh, we'd like to share that. So this is the most basic truth, and Jesus said it. Uh, listen to this. You can be born again. Is that right? Or you should be born again. Is that right? No, he said you must be born again. You must be born again. And without this new birth, what I think Peter is wanting to, to, get, to see, because these are already believers, that he's talking to. Without this new birth, you cannot see correctly. So we have to have these solid foundations in our life before we can realize the power they can have for us to live this new life. He says in John 3, Jesus speaking, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. So that new birth is a spiritual birth, which opens our eyes to spiritual realities. And, but if we're born again, guess what Paul says? He says, we make judgments about all things. To be born again means we receive Christ, and when we receive Christ, we're given new eyes, spiritual eyes, to see reality and what's going on around us. And I'm sure Peter's readers might have thought, well, I know all that. I know that. I know the gospel. But Peter's reminding them that they must really believe all that. You see, so many Christians I see go through life worrying and wondering whether they, when they die, will have eternal life. They'll, they'll, they'll go to heaven. And uh, here, if you lack assurance that you know him, guess what? Your Christian life, you're going to be, you're going to be, uh, you're going to lack courage. You're going to lack that confidence in how to live out your faith. But the Bible says, John speaks in his letter to 1 John, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? And do you know that you know it? You can. Well, he tells us, those who are born again, those who are spiritually alive, will know certain realities. And the language here, I like to think of this, and as he gets to start up, uh, his message here, is like coming out of the womb spiritually and opening your eyes for the first time to some realities that you've never experienced before. And the, the first one, he says, is a living hope. A living hope. He says, born again to what? to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, when you hear someone uh, say they have hope, 
Um, it's kind of interesting. They typically mean they desire something in the future that really they don't really know if it will, will happen at all. It's just kind of a I hope that happens kind of thing. I hope I get this new job. I hope I can get this new car. I hope I can find a place to live. I hope I can fix this relationship. I hope my pants fit after this meal. It's possible, but it may not happen, <laughs> right? So that's the kind of hope that we think of. But Christian hope is different. Biblical hope is different. It not only desires something out there in the future, but it actually expects it to happen. Its expectation is grounded in something. It's grounded in God's power. And the greatest power that ever happened in, in, in history was Jesus was resurrected from the dead. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the problem today, I think, is that as we look around, there is so much hopelessness, so much discouragement. And people will, you know, talk to people and they'll say, uh, you talk about the future and they say, what's the point? Or I don't, I don't expect anything to change. I don't expect anything to get better. You ask them what they're looking forward to uh, in the future and they say, well, nothing really. Nothing really. But the Christians should never think that way. And the reason is because we don't put our hope in our circumstances or in ourself. We put our hope in a person whose name is Jesus. A born-again person lives in the expectation of that living hope. Peter mentions a second reality for those who, who see with these newborn eyes a lasting inheritance. A lasting inheritance. He says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And it was very likely that these, these readers to whom Peter had been talking, they had lost things like their family relationships as they moved away from where they were. They lost jobs. They lost positions. They lost uh, their, their status. They lost privileges. As they moved out of their comfort zone and lived out their faith. But Peter is reminding them that the new birth gave them something that no one could take away. And it was eternal. That inheritance is described by Jesus as treasure in heaven. Do you have treasure in heaven this morning? That kind of thinking was, uh, was what in Peter is intended, and it was intended to encourage them. When everything else goes, when everything else is in your life, when the, when the rug is pulled out from under you because of whatever reason, for whatever purpose that you're going through, you have something that will never be taken from you. Eternal life. Peter mentions a third reality here of those who are living born again, a loving protection. He says it in verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And I can't, I can't help but think of, of the person who suffered mo maybe more than beyond Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have this character named Job. And Job if you think about it, he experienced everything we would not want to experience. Uh, but in that behind-the-scenes conversation, before Job began to experience all his suffering, you have God and Satan in conversation. And uh, God tells Satan he's going to limit what he can do to Job because Satan has accused Job, God of being a, a kind of a hedge of protection around Job. And that was true. Still, as we Christians think about these things, we know that terrible things still can and do happen. We can suffer physically, we can suffer emotionally, we can suffer uh, psychologically, and it's because, a lot of times, because of our faith. But Jesus, uh, he gives us a pattern, I think, even in Matthew 6, how we look at these things. And he, he, he includes the words in that prayer, his pattern of prayer, and he says, deliver us, God, from evil. And that may be, may be including uh, delivering us from the pressure that the world wants to squeeze in to conform us to its ways and, and thinking. 
to direct spiritual warfare from the enemy, maybe deliverance from things that you struggle with, habits, hurts, and hang-ups that you have that you just seem to struggle with, to be delivered from those. Deliver us from evil. But Peter says here that no matter how his readers were alienated by all these things, including the culture, God was going to help them endure and stand firm in their faith. And so this is a good thing. So Peter... He's calling these Christians to see the realities of the new birth. He also says in verses 6 to 9, the next major truth tells him about it, the certainties of real faith. The certainties of real faith. He says in verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the in this is, what are they rejoicing in? Their salvation. This is a great thing. But it's, how many of you know that sometimes all that can seem to go away when our trials face us, hit us face to face? He, he points us back to our great salvation, but he focuses now on the pain. And that's a different story sometimes, isn't it? What we have to go through hurts, and none of us want to hurt, Right? Peter, what do we need to know then to, 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 to believe and make it through? And he tells us three things that I think are so valuable. Number one is that tested faith endures the fire. If it's real, tested faith endures the fire. So that, he says, why are the suffering and the trials? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. And you see, the only way... For you to know and for me to know if your faith is real is if it is tested by the fire. Tested by the fire. If it makes it through the fire, you're golden. And when you do, when you make it through the test and you look back on it, what do you have? You have something really valuable. I have heard over and over people who've gone through and have exited their, their time of struggle and trial and whatever physical, whatever p- problem they go through, they look back on it and they say, I wouldn't trade that for a million dollars for anything because they gained something they could never have had unless they had gone through the suffering. We don't choose it, but in the middle of it, God to turn it around and make something of it, right? And that, so every Christian will be tested. Every Christian will be tested. Um, Have you ever heard this expression, to cook someone's goose? (laughs) To cook someone's goose? Actually, it was a a reference about about a man who lived back in uh, the 1400s. His name, his last name means goose in Czech. And his name was John Hus. John Hus the goose. John John was a pastor in uh, Bethlehem Church in Prague, where uh, he preached to over 3,000 people every week. And uh, the Spirit of God was all over his ministry. And people came from everywhere to hear him proclaim the gospel. Uh, the Archbishop of Prague, though, didn't really care for what he was sharing. He told John, you've got to stop preaching. And these were lig- religious kinds of people. But John refused. He kept on preaching. And uh, he ended up being condemned and removed from his pastorate because of it. So guess what he did? He went out and he began to preach in the streets. And people still came to listen to him. Till the religious leaders decided to put an end to it all, and they decided to put him to death. And on July 16th, 1415, Hus was burned at the stake while singing an old Latin chant, Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. So he's singing as he's burned. To death. I remember watching a film one time about his life that uh, the days before he actually went and, and uh, was in the, at the stake ready to be burned before his life was taken, that scene showed him in his cell, in his dark cell that they were keeping him, and he had a little candle on a table. And uh, you see John Hoos in that scene taking his hand and putting it over the flame and just kind of seeing what it would be like to experience the fire. Here's what I know. Is that God's grace will be with you when you go through the fire and you will get it when you need it and not before. God's grace will be with you in your suffering. 
And Peter goes on to say, faith has been shown, proven by testing, is more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire. It's more precious than gold. Gold is put in the fire, and the fire is so hot that gold just melts away. He says, your faith is more valuable than that. It's more valuable because gold, there are some tests that even gold can't endure. But faith that endures is something that is precious. He uses that word precious. Real faith is precious. Do you realize that one day when Christ returns, everything that exists will burn up that's not been made to last? Everything when Christ returns. Malachi says it like this, but who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal. Paul writes it like this, his workmanship will be evident because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. So your faith, if it endures, will last forever. Tested faith will go through fire and come out on the other side. And so we have to know, Peter kind of gets this to us, what we're, getting when, what we're getting when we go through the darkness of trials. It's not just the pain that we get. We get the fruit of it, the benefit of it. He offers one more, another thing. He said Christian suffering has a purpose. And what is it? That we may be found, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why we need to know what we believe, because it will settle us and ground us for the days to come. Sometimes in the fire of our suffering, we're so close to the flames that we can't see the bigger picture. You know, when we were first uh, married, um, we, uh, one of the first things we did, we went to a little shop, and I don't remember, maybe it was the, maybe at the mall, and together my wife and I picked out a, a picture, and uh, I liked ships and boats in the sea, and so we picked out a boat that's, uh, that's still, we have the picture today, it's kind of crude, an oil painting, and the picture is of a, a boat, a ship, out on the ocean, and the ocean is in turmoil. The waves are high, and it looks like the boat is in trouble. And for years, that hung on our wall. And what we looked at was the boat. And we never saw in the distance there was a lighthouse. Because we were looking at the boat. And Peter is trying to get us in the same way to say, look beyond the boat and the storm that you're in and look to the light that I offer you in the gospel. It will give you and will get you where you need to be. Remember Joseph? Joseph was in a pit. And then he got thrown into prison. And ultimately he wound up in the palace And it wasn't until Joseph realized through all that suffering, trouble, and trial, it was only then that he could see God's hand in it all. Unfairly treated, unjustly accused, he said to those who had heard him, his brothers, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What a perspective. And it's the perspective we all have to have as we we go through things we don't particularly care for. God's going to use it and make good out of it. I ask you, do you have a theology of suffering? Do you have a perspective of how God works in your suffering? Peter's trying to tell us that whenever we go, whatever trial we go through, it's scoring points for us in heaven. Paul says it like this, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So Peter says, if you do this right, 
If you think of this right, if you're grounded in the gospel, it results in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And remembering that will carry us through all the distresses we may be experiencing in this life. In fact, I will say this, this is the consistent pattern in the New Testament. Suffering is followed by glory. You say, where did Peter get this? Well, he just watched Jesus. Suffering followed by glory. And Jesus passed on to him these truths, not just for Peter's readers, but for us too. And then the third thing he says, we can see fruit even now. Verses 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, see him now, but you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Peter is saying that we don't have to see to believe. There are some things that are more real than what we can see with our physical eyes. And if you want to know that your faith is real, you, have to look, you, you, you don't have to look any further than the fruit that's coming out of your life. He mentioned some, love for, uh, for God, love for others. Do you see that in your life? Trust that obeys no matter what you might feel, that it's hard. Joy that rises above your circumstances, that inward sense of things are okay, and I'm, I'm a contented person. Yeah, yeah, we walk by faith and not by sight, right? So these, all these are things that are, that are great evidences of real faith, and by them we know we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. And, uh, you know, that doesn't make our, our current situation, our current circumstances, doesn't make them go away, it doesn't make them less painful, but it should encourage us that we can make it. We can make it, standing in all kinds of trials. And so if we rejoice and to have this attitude, we're to have this attitude in the midst of our troubles. Listen to what James says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Produces steadfastness. You can stand up in the middle of it. And you'll last. Oh, he goes on, this last thing he talks about here, living well in a culture of chaos, is to consider this gospel in verses 3 to 12 and the privileges, the privileges of amazing grace. That's a key word, privileges. And he talks about this. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets, and this is, this is what the prophets sought. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. I mean, they were painstaking trying to figure out what God was giving and what, what it meant, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Readers of Peter and you, Trinity, and every Christian, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The prophets didn't know who it was or when it would happen when they gave the predictive prophecy about, about Christ's suffering. Someone, uh, I think, has compared their, their uh, task as almost like taking an arrow and shooting it in the air with the prophecy and that, that arrow landing somewhere out there. And it, and it just so happens to land at our feet hundreds of years later. And so what a privilege it is. The arrow of God's grace landing at your feet. All the prophets knew that what they were searching for, they only knew this, it was for you. They were serving you. And that ought to make us feel humbled and blessed and thankful for this great salvation that we have. Jesus said, I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. 
This is what the prophets sought. Let me end with this. And it's what the angels desired. This is so cool. Things into which angels long to look. And this is an amazing verse. The phrase there, long to look. The angels long to look. It's a single word in the original. It means, it means to bend down and look in from the outside. It was used when Peter ran ahead of all the disciples at, at the day of the resurrection. And he runs ahead of everyone and he, he gets to the tomb and he bends down to look in to see, is there anyone there to peer inside? So the picture here is of the angels bending down over the rails of heaven to see what only you can know. The great salvation, looking and peering from the outside in about the wonders of salvation. Why would the angels marvel at our salvation? Because the angels aren't saved. Only humans can be redeemed. They can only wonder by looking from the outside in and looking on as outsiders about what we've been given. What a privilege. Listen, if the angels get excited about this salvation, why don't we? We should be so amazed by this salvation that we don't take it for granted. It is an immeasurable privilege. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 2, 2 verse 3 asks, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? John Piper, commenting on that verse, says, Is there a sense of greatness in your mind about your salvation? Or do you neglect it? Do you respond to the greatness of your salvation? Or do you treat it in the way you treat your last will and testament? or the title to your car, or the deed on your house. You signed it once, and it is in a file drawer somewhere. But it's not a really great thing in your mind. You rarely think about it. It has no daily effect on you. Basically, you neglect it. But my friends, we can't afford to. Looking at what may be coming and looking at what we go through on a daily basis, we need to see the great privilege of our amazing grace, God's amazing grace. We need to see what the angels saw. Well, these are, these are the foundational truths we have to believe if we're going to know how to live. And the question is, can the gospel fix what's broken? Can the gospel prepare us? for what's next or what's next in your life? And yes, that's the right answer. Yes, but only if we believe it and stand on its realities, its certainties, its privileges. You say, how do you do that? Hang on. That's for the, that's for the weeks to come. <laughs> so, Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, this great salvation that has come to us and like an arrow shot from generations and hundreds of years ago has landed at our feet. Lord, help us not to take it for granted, but to discover the truths that it shares with us about life and eternity and about you, Jesus. We'll apply these truths to our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Great job. Well, keep coming for more from First Peter, right? We do have a prayer team that's going to be up front. Don't forget that Bartek is going to be here if you want to hang out with him this week. Um, find some time to have him over for dinner. He's available for that. Just get with him, and he'll get you on the schedule. And then our children's um, meeting is going to be our yearly children's meeting, so please be here for lunch here in just 15 minutes or so. And uh, then also we have our prayer time for the month of April uh, at 1.30. Now, listen, you don't have to come from 1.30 to 3. You can come any time between 1.30 and 3. It's a pray as you like at any time. 
the, the church will be open for you to do that, all right? Well, Lord, I just pray you bless each and every person here, God. You'd fill them with your spirit. You'd help each and every one of us, Lord God, to be your light. Lord, that when people look at us, they see you. Father God, I just pray that you keep them safe from any schemes of the devil. God, keep us safe from sicknesses until we gather again, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.